J'ai le plaisir de présenter Madame Astrid Brandt, ministère de la Culture, qui va présider cette, cette session et je lui laisse la, la parole immédiatement. Merci, merci beaucoup Bertrand, merci de m'avoir invité à présider cette séance de, de l'après-midi sur l'évaluation des risques et leur réduction. C'est un grand plaisir pour moi de présider cette, cette séance euh, avec deux intervenants mondialement connus, Stéphane Milkalski de l'Institut canadien de conservation et James Raleigh du Image Permanence Institute euh, faisant partie du Rochester Institute of Technology. Euh, les recherches sur les risques, leur évaluation et leur réduction dans le domaine de la conservation et de la préservation, de façon plus générale, se sont développées euh, depuis maintenant euh, un certain nombre d'années. Euh, et il faut espérer que dans notre monde de la conservation, les enseignements de nos prestigieux intervenants euh, soient mieux compris et mieux intégrés que dans celui du monde de la finance. Gage pour ne pas voir une crise de la conservation comme la crise de la dette. Le pari est ouvert et j'invite euh, Stéphane euh, à euh, venir donc à la tribune pour euh, faire sa présentation juste avant euh, qu'il ne commence. Euh, je voudrais euh, quand même, enfin on m'a demandé de le présenter, je ne sais pas si c'est vraiment nécessaire parce que comme je l'ai dit, euh, tout le monde connaît euh, Stéphane, mais euh, donc euh, je, je le fais quand même. Euh, je le fais en anglais puisqu'en fait j'ai sa biographie euh, en, en anglais devant les yeux et euh, donc euh, je vous fais un bref résumé. Uh, Stefan Mikalski is a senior conservation scientist uh, at the Canadian Conservation Institute. Since 1979, Stefan has uh, developed and provided advice at CCI for both preservation and treatments. He has published over 60 papers, including reviews in, in the following, physics of suction table, treatments, physics of varnish removal by solvents, uh, rates of light damage, leakage of enclosures, the mechanics of paintings, mechanics of gilding, and the physics of consolidation of porous artifacts. He uh, was a lead also for the humidity and temperature specifications in the museums, gallery, archives and libraries, chapter of the ASHRAE Applications Handbook um, in 1999 um, and um, uh, also in the edition from 2011. And uh, he is author of the CCI Technical Bulletin, the Guidance of Humidity and Temperature for Canadian Archives and uh, Living at present in Rome and um, teaching at uh, uh, ICROM. Uh, so please, uh, Stefan, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, just a small correction in case my managers are watching this. Um, I work completely and teach for CCI, but we do have some partnerships with ICROM, business and otherwise. So. I'm not going to talk about relative humidity or temperature, so I will leave that for um, the, the others with uh, perspectives on that. I wanted to speak today about something that's been a large part of what I've been focused on for the last 10 years, and which was uh, one of the projects that was central to our liaison with ICROM. So the title is Cost Effectiveness and Cost Effectiveness Ratio. All the slides are in both languages, blue for the French and red for the English. So this conference is about sustainability. So this is one of the more famous photographs that made people rather more aware of the fact that the planet that we live on is finite. And this is the 50th anniversary of this August Institute who are hosting us here. Thank you very much. I thought I'd put your 50 in green, since that's the theme of the conference. 
And right here in green is uh, Bertrand Lavadine, uh, a wonderful host and the director who had the pleasure of working with last week at the Conservation Science Forum in Rome. I think Bertrand is waving yes, yes, not no, no here. This is my co-author, Irene Karsten, while she's teaching risk assessment in Beijing a few years ago. <clears throat> so I just want to review briefly for those who are not familiar with what we refer to as risk management. The risk management steps are conventional, any text or poster or literature on risk management in business or in industry will tend to have a variation on these steps. Establish the context of the project or the risk of the heritage asset you're trying to assess or manage. Identify the risks, analyze the risks, evaluate the risks, and treat the risks. And for those of you who wonder whether those of us in risk management ever mention the word preventive conservation, um, this is where I see it. Preventive conservation is the treat risks step of risk management, except the previous four steps on analysis and evaluation tends not to occur. It's more of a rule-based um, observation, intuition, long experience-based um, approach. This is just to prove that it is possible to be happy and learn about risk management. This is the course in Quito. Um, with the big red circle to indicate that it's an ongoing process. One doesn't just do a risk management or risk assessment project and then walk away and hope that the museum is fine for the next 50 years. This is the tool that uh, I will be showing you some results out of. Um, this is a database. This is the opening form for the database, which allows Irene and myself to do the risk assessments that we do currently in Canada. We are doing uh, these risk assessments are, are labor intensive. They take several months of uh, two people's time. I don't see these as a service that we're going to roll out to 2,000 museums and galleries across Canada. This I see as field research. So what I want to show you is some of the patterns that we're uncovering when we do a rigorous, careful analysis of all of the risks in a small to medium-sized museum, which are, which are the primary clients of my institute. So, so far we've done two historic house museums, one medium-sized city art gallery in a modern building, uh, one uh, provincial archive with uh, records in the many millions, and Irene is currently doing a large science and technology museum, our National Museum of Science and Technology. So we're looking at a range in order to uncover the patterns and to develop a library of risks which will then we hope, make the process much more efficient. What the, gra uh, the database allows us to do, among other things, is, is produce graphs for the reports. Um, I'm going to show you some of the results from this, the first historic house that we did. This is not intended to be a, a, a comprehensive, rigorous presentation. Uh, I'm going to want to give you a flavor of some of the things that are emerging. But the things I show for this house are repeating themselves in other museums of its type that we assess. So we produce what's called in the business management field a tornado graph. It's half a tornado. Um, it seems to be more visual and uh, emotive when it's uh, horizontal graph like this, arranged like this. So these are the different risks. The red, yellow, and blue refer to the three different components which we analyze in order to get a total risk uh, score, which is scored uh, on the bottom there from 0 to 15. When I use the word magnitude, I will mean an 
order of magnitude scale or a logarithmic scale or a geometric scale, whichever those terms you prefer. It's like the Richter scale for earthquakes. So one step on this scale makes a huge difference. There's seven orders of magnitude. In other words, 10 million times difference in the size of the risk between the top risk, which is total fire to the building, and the bottom risk, which was some brown spots on one pastel, which was moderately important to the museum. We can add to uncertainty bars for those who wonder whether we are deluding ourselves as to the precision. These are based on high and low estimates, which we always place into the database. You can see that some of those bars, the white and black bars, which indicate the range from high estimate to low estimate are quite large. But that being said, one can partition these into roughly three groups of risks that are clearly different. There's a top third, which is high, a middle third, medium, and, and the bottom third. Within that, uh, the ranking is not highly precise. We're looking for prioritization. We're looking for the top five risks in the end. This is what that same graph looks like if we plot it on linear scales. This axis, it shows the fraction of the risk as a fraction of the biggest one. So if the biggest one is fire at one, then the others drop off very quickly. One of the advantages of a magnitude scale is that you can see differences between the risks, even though they cover a range of 10 million to one. But if you want to emphasize the importance of the top two or three risks, then you can present it uh, like this. <clears throat> I would want to uh, mention here that when we were first going out and planning the risk assessment after several years of working with ICROM and ICN uh, on teaching a risk course, and reducing risk to collections since uh, 2003, we um, thought we were ready to start doing a really intensive assessment within a Canadian uh, museum. And when we were discussing what the report would be, uh, Irene and I were thinking really in just in terms of a risk assessment. We were going to do an assessment and make a report and present that risk graph and tell them, these are your risks, these are your priorities. And Julie, who's from outside the field and who is an educator, education officer, uh, said, if I were a client, I would really like some advice on what to do about them. And I realized that Actually, 20 years ago when I did more conventional preventive conservation reports, I went straight to giving advice about what to do. Uh, the weakness there was I didn't have really good evidence to say why I thought that was a good thing to do. Mm, we fell into a trap when we first looked at risk analysis and risk assessment of forgetting of the forgetting the treatment side. So I'm going to focus on that now, what we've discovered. So stage five was treat risks, in other words, preventive conservation. Within this step, you have to identify options for reducing risk. You need to estimate the costs. You need to analyze the residual risk. You need to calculate the risk reduction, and then you evaluate the options based on those above. And then you implement the selected options. So now I'm going to focus in on 5.5. How do we propose to evaluate an option within the large framework of doing quantified risk assessment? Well, we can evaluate it by its effectiveness. And by that I mean, how much risk does it reduce? Or we can evaluate it by its cost. Or by its cost-effectiveness ratio. 
or by all of the above? And the correct answer is all of the above. <clears throat> and what I want to show is that those things, three things, don't necessarily give the same uh, evaluation. So, what is the effectiveness of an option? Effectiveness is equal to risk reduction. And risk reduction is equal to the untreated risk, quantified, I'm always looking at quantities here, untreated risk minus the residual risk after treatment, or in other words, after the option is implemented. So one needs to redo the analysis for each risk and each option on that risk so that one can make this subtraction and uh, then move on to the effectiveness cost ratio. Now, you may notice I've turned the two words around. Generally in business and um, health field, they use a cost to effectiveness ratio. We found it more useful and communicable to give effectiveness over cost. In other words, what is effectiveness over cost? It's the reduction of risk divided by the cost per year. So, how much did we reduce risk and how much does it cost to maintain that? Or in other words, in more familiar terms of preventive conservation, it's the prevention of loss in value per year because of your option. You, you actually saved some part of the collection that otherwise would lose value, divided by the cost per year. We do calculate the cost per year using not only the maintenance annual cost, but also the capital cost. So if you buy a new machine, you take that cost and you spread it out over the selected time horizon. Whatever project the museum wants to think about, how long into the future are they planning? We typically default to 30 years. That's partway between business and government who think 10 years is an awfully long time. And uh, archives and heritage business that likes to think in 100 years or 1,000 years. So prevention of loss in value per year divided by the cost per year. So this is the form in the database where you place the risks and the options. I just want to say that over here is the name of an option. You up to five options. What, the one in white is the one that's currently being worked on. This is a description or an explanation of why the A score, which here is the frequency or the rate, is slower. And here's where the two scores are. In yellow is the old risk score before we started thinking about options and the white numbers are the estimated time for that event to occur if we implement the option and in this case the estimate is it's twice as long before the roof is likely to collapse. This is a museum I'm going to give you some <coughs> details on. Excuse me. So now I'm going to show you some data which shows the general relationship between those three parameters which I said were uh, sometimes in contradiction or in conflict. That is, how much did the option reduce the risk? How much does that option cost? And what is the ratio between those two? In a simple-minded world, you'd just say, <clears throat> I want the most effective options that reduce the most risk for the least money, which would therefore give me a terrific ratio of benefits to cost. All right, <clears throat> I actually, I'm going to have a few graphs. This is a graph across the bottom of the magnitude of risk, which we abbreviate to MR. And vertically, we also have magnitude of risk reduction. And the red line is the perfect risk reduction option. In other words, 
if I have originally a five <coughs> risk and I reduce it by five, that's perfect, I've got nothing left. If I have a 15 risk, which by the way is you lose everything in one year, it's rather a high risk. We, don't, we, we haven't used it yet. We usually don't go higher than about 13, which means there's a good chance you lose everything in 100 years. <coughs> Now I'm going to show you where 37 risks and 68 options, which were analyzed for this particular historic house museum, where they fall. Now bear in mind these are, these are magnitude of risk scales, so um, the fact that the squares are sitting pretty much on top of the red line doesn't mean they're exactly that, but they're, it means that they are removing 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of the risk. And then there's a few out here. By the time they come down one step, this unit is only removing one-tenth of the risk. Uh, this this option is pretty useless. It's two steps down, so it's removing one percent of the estimated risk. Now these are the costs for those risks. There's lots of interesting little things that one can find, and, and Irene has, has published a paper at uh, DemHist conference, a conference on historic house museums that was in the U.S. a year ago, on patterns of the types of risk. And I'm just going to look here at the overall trends in these three uh, parameters. So a big scatter in the costs. Now these costs are also on this logarithmic scale, so you can think of this as how many zeros are there um, on the price. So this has one zero, no zeros, one zero, two zeros, three zeros, four zeros, hundred thousand dollar option. Most, most of them are between fifty thousand dollars per year. Some of these are big half million dollar proposals spread out over thirty years. Up here I've shifted up just for clarity, and here's the scale. This is the ratio of the effectiveness to the cost. And this also shows huge scatter, uh, which essentially means some options which we, we looked at things which are considered plausible or realistic or even good advice in traditional preventive conservation and some of them are appallingly inefficient in their use of money and some of them are quite efficient. Bear in mind that this, even though the price goes up and down, this ratio is correcting for price. This is saying whether it's a million dollar proposal or a ten dollar proposal, how much benefit, how much risk reduction did you get per dollar? And uh, this is a huge spread. There's seven orders of magnitude. <laughs> and that doesn't include the ones where we just went, nah, won't even bother analyzing that one. There's no way it's going to be effective. So we actually self-selected already, and we still ended up with a huge spread. Initially, Irene said, and I said, oh, this is going to make a very interesting paper at a conservation conference, and she said, you do it. I don't think I want to get up there and say that's how inefficient some of our traditional methods are. All right, so what are the conclusions from here? Um, options that reduce large risks tend to have a better effectiveness to cost ratio. And you can see that in the fact that this is a steep slope, whereas, you know, this sounds like a big range in money to us between a dollar and 10,000 per year. But relative to the range in the size of the risk and the size of the efficiency, it's actually quite a ma small range. Um, if efficiency was the same for everything, you would expect this line to have the same slope as, uh, as this one. All right, I'm going to look at some examples of the two extremes. This is a high risk and a good ratio, so it's good efficiency if, or good effectiveness per dollar. Uh, this museum had a section with a very poor roof and the 
facilities manager was quite upset at the bad work that the municipality had done for them and he was convinced that the wood joists would be rotting and uh, collapsing soon because the water pooled during the winter and it had very little slope. So on the left we have a good historic house roof recently restored and on the right we have this extension with quite a lot of artifacts under it which will collect water. So monitor moisture content of joists to reduce the probability of collapse. We, we, we looked at several options including tell the city to come back and do it again and not surprisingly that didn't have a terrifically high uh, effectiveness to cost ratio because it was such a high cost and there wasn't the most important artifacts under here. But simp we estimated what it would cost to uh, get a moisture meter and just keep an eye on whether the wood was soaking wet given that in Canada you had some time between when the wood gets wet and when it actually gets weak from rot. You, you have a year to react. This is another one with high risk and good ratio. Improve exterior door hardware to reduce probability of theft. This is the opposite extreme. Um, these are low risks and they also have very poor ratio of effectiveness to cost. This was, we were asked to look at, we're worried that visitors in the hallways will bump into the picture frames, the gilded frames, and abrade them. And there already was a small acrylic protector here. And we were asked to look at the, like, what was the value of adding an, a properly done acrylic protector, which isn't hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it's not ten dollars either. It's a several hundred dollar range. And when we worked out the probability and the likely damage, uh, it was not a high risk and was not effective use of money, given other priorities. Low risk and very poor ratio, another one is uh, improved filtration on air handling system to reduce pollutants, dust on objects. So we, not unlike Frank Ligtrink, working with the National Archives in uh, Holland, Netherlands, not possible to justify the cost of active air filtration in many systems and certainly not in this house. Here's one which is more important. Reduction of a very high risk, but not a very good ratio. But a hugely important risk. This was their number one risk. Install a fire suppression system. This is what happened to a Canadian Museum 20 years ago that didn't put in automatic suppression. It burned to the ground, total loss. So, but that costs around $500,000 if it's done by the current building code for public dwellings. We still recommended this. This was our number one recommendation to the museum to pursue the funding for fire suppression, although it was not the most cost-effective ratio. It was quite good. It wasn't bad like the ones I showed you. It was in the middle. But this was an example where we have to go by our priorities, and our priorities are not simply to spend your money well, but to address your biggest risks. And I actually naively thought in the beginning that those two would coincide every time. They often do, but not always. So what do we do next? Um, one of the things that Irene's really asked for, because she needs it, is to add to the database, which is my responsibility, effectiveness of one option that reduces several risks. At the moment, we can only calculate one risks against its three or four options. And we, we know and we teach that um, some options will address many risks, especially major options like upgrading facilities. So that's a matter of expanding the capacity of the, of the databases code. 
The other thing that would be good to do is to make the calculation easy to do on cost effectiveness of all options together. When Rob Waller and I wrote a, our paper for ICOMC's many years ago on a paradigm shift, one of the objectives was to reduce the total risk as much as possible with finite resources. That's essentially the same as saying make the cost effectiveness when it's calculated across all risks and all options as high as possible. And um, we're already looking into adding not just cost in terms of dollars, but cost in terms of footprint. That will be relatively straightforward in the database. It's, it will just be like every other aspect of risk analysis, doing the dog's work to find the data and usable, reliable models. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I don't know if there's time for questions. Thank you very much, Stefan. Yes, indeed. Uh, do, do we have uh, time for two questions? Yeah? Okay. Donc, on a le temps pour uh, deux questions. Uh, si quelqu'un veut... Um, I have two questions about the database. Uh, first question is about uh, the place where you use the database. Uh, it seems that to be something very... Um, USA and Canada, climate, economy, and um, institutions oriented. Is it possible to adapt it to other climates and to other countries with uh, economically less uh, well organized? This is my first question. The second one is that we see we could uh, assist since uh, the last years to an acceleration in the climate change and in the pollution and everything like that, very acceler a big acceleration. So does your database take in account this acceleration in, uh, the, ca the, in the way you calculate the risk management? Actually, um, what I'm about to say addresses both of those questions. Uh, fundamentals. The database is not a simulation or a model to calculate individual risks. It is essentially a uh, spreadsheet with extra features to keep track and organize your own mental effort <laughs> and to do the calculations of the ranking and scoring once you have said, I think my silver object will tarnish to an unacceptable visual level in eight years. And I think putting it in this display case will make that 40 years. And I think my silver object, uh, all of my silver objects are average objects in my collection. Or I think, as an earlier speaker said, they are more significant. We actually ask people, we require the user to try to quantify that. I think this object is worth virtually everything else in the museum. I found that small museums and medium-sized museums are actually quite comfortable. They have already done that. Um, but uh, the larger mega museums tend to want to consider everything as priceless, uh, which is a, a difficult barrier to get through, despite its obvious absurdity. Uh, so this is not a simulation or, or a, or a um, FEM model or any kind of, I put in my, it doesn't have climate data, for example. We have distributed this database in earlier forms throughout the world during the uh, ICRAM, CCI, ICN risk course. So it's been used by people in Beijing, in Quito, which is why I had it already. There's a button to change languages, so it's in French and Spanish, and it will take any character set. So it could be in Chinese or Slovenian. Um, so it, it's not that kind of a calculator. It's really a kind of business manager's calculator. That being said, I feel it does a lot of work. It, 
It guides the user in things which otherwise you need to explain so that when they click on it's you first you select of what kind of risk is in an event that's rare is in an event that's frequent is it a proce process and then all of the questions that need to change on that form as a result of that first answer they change so that the wording is uh, guides the user and things that we've discovered over the years are where the user first time user gets confused so the extent to which the forms can act like a decision tree for the kinds of questions that you want to ask. They, it does that. But it's completely not regionally dependent. There's nothing in it other than the language of the words on the form which is regionally determined. Thank you. I'm afraid.